And I want to jump directly into the two of them because we've already heard from Penny representing uh, a government agency and also, of course, uh, from Eddie uh, on behalf of a fuel supplier. Um, now, for this session, we talk about the challenges for an ECA and the ECA requirements and how we are going to comply with the uh, regulations. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Captain Vinay, uh, from a ship operator's perspective, what would you think uh, would be the biggest challenge for us to sail into this ECA discussion and to think about you know, the implications on your operation? Thanks, Simon. To address that, I would mention that a cost and return on investment are integrated into the success of any enterprise. Shipping is similar enterprise. It's a paradox to invest large amounts in new technology with no assurance of return. Today, we are living in a world of duopoly. There are only two engine makers remaining, and their priorities are not aligned with the interests of seven billion and growing human population. 94% ocean transport carries all the raw material and finished goods across the world. Without that, many of us would remain very prosperous or very poor in your respective countries. This is the impact of the ocean transportation. We are also witnessing results of very inferior residual fuel and grossly inefficient process of combustion. I personally feel that the progress is stifled by the duopoly of engine makers when better and superior technology does exist. It's not been implemented we are also witnessing some large investments in wrong technology, not economically viable, nor ecologically acceptable. I am privileged to discuss, as Simon said, the challenges related to ECA, emission control areas. The challenges far exceed NOx and SOx. NOx, as you know, is a byproduct of the process of combustion, exothermic reaction, which releases energy in converting chemical energy to mechanical energy, very simply defined. SOx is about sulfur contents, the leftover ingredient in crude and refining process. You ask me what challenges does a ship owner or ship operator face? Many. The risk has grown many fold. The risk in terms of, as Mari mentioned some time ago, in burning lighter fuels in engine which is designed to burn heavier fuels. The heat that is required is not there. It is affecting both the lubricity, which is causing abnormal wear down of uh, very sensitive elements in the combustion process, namely the plunger and the barrel. You have to replace the parts more often and at less interval. To give you an example, if a typical fuel pump will survive 16,000 hours now you may have to do it after 4,000 hours. That's destruction. And that is added cost. Switching fuel is enormous cost. In the United States, on the West Coast alone, 120 ships lost propulsion, switching over from heavy to light fuel. Just last year, global numbers are frightening. The part and the wear down and the frequency of their replacement or renewal or overhauling itself is a big burden on the ship owner. Not to exaggerate, but the risk element has increased so much. The lubricity, which really cannot be met when you have sulfur contents 0.1%, it has to be substituted, as Mr. Fish mentioned some time ago, 
by introducing chillers, coolers, and here this one, scrubbers. Those monstrous scrubbers do nothing. You have to look at superior technology, and the superior technology exists, but it may not serve the purpose of the engine makers. As I said, there is duopoly, and they are now tinkering with these scrubbers not going anywhere else. A technology exists, and the only way to get rid of NOx is by remediation. I shall elaborate that tomorrow, the specifics of that process. And I think these are some of the cost-sensitive and safety-related issues that the ship operator is facing today. Thank you, Captain. Um, and as you said, there are some technical issues that we've just touched upon that will be addressed and discussed in tomorrow's program. Um, so maybe we can uh, stay focused a little bit more on the policy and the strategic level for this discussion. Not to say that technical issues and safety issues are not important, but maybe that would be the focus for tomorrow's dis discussion. And right now we can you know, uh, really focus on the high level uh, kind of discussion. If I may uh, then turn to uh, Lasse, um, since you are coming from Norway with a lot of European experience, and of course Europe has two emission control areas, one in the North Sea and one in the Baltic Sea, focusing on SOX uh, requirements. And I notice and I know that you know, there has been some discussion about also considering uh, having the, uh, you know, the NOx limit being considered in the emission control area as well. Is that true? And can you share a little bit about that as well? <coughs> as you said, uh, there are two uh, emission control areas uh, for SOX, uh, one in the North Sea and one in the Baltic uh, areas. And um, both in both uh, areas, th they are discussing to, to take in the NOx also. Um, I think the North Sea area is ready to, uh, to apply for the NOx. Uh, and uh, there are a discussion going on uh, in the Baltic uh, and will be a meeting uh, next week uh, in the Helsinki to discuss whether they should also apply for, uh, for the NOx. Uh, there are um, nearly all uh, the countries uh, agreeing, but some countries don't want it and maybe they will apply uh, anyway, uh, but uh, application will then be a problem uh, in one or two countries. But we hope this will happen because uh, we think the NOx requirements is, uh, is very important. And uh, in Norway, we have a special uh, NOx uh, uh, program. And uh, I will say a little bit more about that tomorrow. Yeah. Um, now, since we are beginning to have this discussion here in Hong Kong and also in this region about setting up uh, an emission control area, um, it's uh, natural for me to think that, of course, we should go for both uh, as, uh, you know, the SOX uh, control area as well as a NOx emission control area. Um, do you agree with that assumption, or do you think there are other considerations that we should be aware of? Mm, I agree with you, because uh, NOx is, uh, is for new uh, ships, new engines. So uh, then you could, uh, you could utilize new technology and, uh, and have a reduction of NOx uh, at the same time as you reduce uh, SOX. So uh, I would... Uh, Hope you go for a for a NECA area. Okay. Now um, I've got questions for Penny and for Eddie, but maybe it's time for me to open up the floor so that you can also ask your questions to our speakers and our panelists. Uh, can I have, please, uh, Richard? Penny, if I could ask you the same question I asked you at the American Chamber of Commerce breakfast uh, a week ago, because I think the answer was useful. Um, you talked a bit about the California going first, setting their own standards. This is in some way like what we're doing here in Hong Kong. What were the particular issues, challenges, problems associated with somebody acting in that manner? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think uh, some of the issues that were encountered were, well, first of all, and I'll, st I'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow on the fuel switching side. Um, you know, that was, it was a lot of, proving ground, I think, there for uh, what were some of the issues going to be um, in switching the fuel? Was it going to, you know, 
uh, cause loss of propulsion um, and things like that? Is it going to increase wear and tear on the engines and things like that? So, um, uh, you know, w uh, California then commissioned a study, which I'll talk about tomorrow, um, that looked at, uh, I think it was two years into their fuel switching, I think it was in 2011, yeah. Um, and they did a survey um, in cooperation with the California Maritime Academy to um, survey vessel operators um, on what their experience was. And, and indeed, there were some issues, for sure. But then they uh, set about coming up with recommendations about how to rectify those, those uh, technical challenges. And I'll go into that tomorrow. So that's one issue, I guess. But it's, it, I think in the end, it turned out to be a real positive because we learned a lot from, from the experience in California. Um, so that's one. Um, I think, you know, uh, again, from the regulatory perspective and I think from the industry implementation perspective, there was a lot of experience gained from uh, <laughs> watching California uh, implement the um, fuel switching rule uh, in 2009. Yeah. Can I have another question from the floor? Good afternoon. My name is Sudhir Bimani. I'm from Anglo Eastern. My first question is for Eddie. Uh, HDME 50. Uh, whatever information we have from the market, because we run more than 470 ships worldwide, uh, is compatibility problems are too much with different refineries' problem with HDME 50 as per the lab analysis. Now, my suggestion to you. Keeping in mind these problems which many ships which may face in future, why don't you publish reports of compatibility of your oil, HDME 50 and other ones which you are started uh, manufacturing and uh, supplying from three, four countries to publish them in a way, proper way so that we know whether can we change over with other refineries oil or no. Because there are few tanks only on ship where this oil needs to be stored and it has to go in the same tank in which 0.1% sulfur oil taken from some other country is stored earlier. So there are a lot of mixing problems. Second question, second thing is regarding, uh, as Paddy has said, regarding the criteria for ECA area for, for IMO approval is very stringent with a lot of points every country has to uh, comply, which may be very difficult for China and many other countries which would like to have ECA zone, like say Hong Kong. So at the end of the day, what may happen is that every country may come out with their own regulation because it may not be feasible to get it approved in IMO for their country as ECA area. So what will happen is, Hong Kong will have their own regulation, 0.5, some other country will come out with 0.2, 0.3, anything what they feel like. And it will be very difficult for sh shipping world practically to store all these different type of oil because the charter will supply what is available and what is cheaper for them. So I would like to suggest, let all of us, all countries, developing countries, put it across to IMO. 30 years back, all of us were running ships and coming to port with diesel oil. We all were changing from fuel oil to diesel oil, which was low sulfur oil, and we had no issues. So everywhere around the world, we can go after changing over, and it will be same oil, 0.1% or whatever you all decide, but it will be one regulation all around the world. Thank you. Eddie. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start with the, the, the second sort of part um, first. Um, I can empathize with you as ship owner operators. Um, you know, the fuel decision is just one of numerous decisions that you have to get your head around, you know, with the EEDI and the energy efficiency design index, you know, the shape of ships, the anti-fouling paint on the outside, ballast water standards as well. I mean, goodness, you need a degree in, uh, in, in, in shipping just to sort of know what the changes are. Um, so I'll let some of the others comment on, you know, how we can approach IMO in that respect. Um, if you just, from what I've read in the press recently, you know, the Europeans are 
you know, have, have come and said, well, we'll go in 2020 irrespective, trying to sort of force IMO's hands, if you can sort of see it quite cynically uh, as well. But I'll certainly let the, the others comment. Um, with regards to HDMI 50, the, um, the good challenge that we had being first to market with this product as well was that because it is different in nature, it is clean like a distillate product, but handles like a fuel oil. It didn't meet ISO specifications as we were initially, you know, marketing the product as. It was, you know, sold against DMA specifications with certain exceptions. Those good exceptions being viscosity and flash point, which actually make its handling easier on board, you know, for fellow engineers. Um, now, due to the charter party agreements and the feedback that we've had is that, oh, I have a charter party agreement, I have to buy to an ISO 8217 specification. So that's why now we are able and able to guarantee selling the product to RMD 80. Now, it was designed to meet the 0.10% sulfur limits. It has been trialed very successfully and continues to be used very successfully and without issue by many, many different people. And to me, the proof is in the actual trial. Indeed, you know, I've read um, some cases in the media um, questioning the compatibility. Uh, and, you know, I liked and, and I tried to sort of cover this as well. Using the spot test method to compare HDME 50 against another distillate was you know, the incorrect test method. And we are trying our best to educate the testing agencies as well as the consultants. You know, we, we tried and we corrected and yet the paper was still, still published, frustratingly. Um, so the good news is that we are working with um, different labs and I'm ha happy to confirm that Premium HDMI 50 is compatible with all of the ExxonMobil products that we've tested it against, including AFME 200 and the marine gas oils. We are also reaching out and are looking to test it against others because your point is very valid. You know, how does it compare? Can it be mixed with others as well? Because in some cases, some mixing will need to occur. Now, those results are looking very favorable. Um, I'm still awaiting for some to come back, but over the course of the coming weeks, we will be able to share that. Because instead of just you know, disregarding somebody's research, as correct or as incorrect you might understand it to be, the best way is to let's do the research, let's involve ourselves with other partners, not just from an educational standpoint, but also from a compatibility standpoint as well. So watch this space, uh, but you know, thank you for, for, for raising that and allowing me to clarify further. Uh, sure. I, so I think your question uh, about consistency is what I heard. Is that right? Um, in terms of just everybody going to the IMO <laughs> together. <laughs> I think that'd be great, honestly. Uh, uh, you know, I but I do also appreciate the you know the re there are regional complexities that um, uh, you know political complexities there are legal complexities uh, that are very different uh, from one part of the world to the next right so I I I think that from what I heard and what I understand um, is is happening here um, in this region. Uh, you know, I think, yes, it'd be fantastic if everybody could go as a whole country, uh, China, to IMO and get a countrywide ICA. That would be ideal. And to go, you know, do the NOx and do, you know, do the uh, sulfur as well. Um, that's the ideal world. But uh, short of that, I think the approach that's, that's happening, that seems to be happening and rolling out here, uh, starting at a regional level in the PRD, YRD, uh, where you have major, you know, the major shipping uh, hubs uh, globally, really, um, I think is a is a really great, great first step. And even that, I understand, is going to be very complicated just to do that. Uh, so I, I I think yes, ideally in a in a ideal world, it would be great to have just a countrywide ECA off the bat. Um, but short of that, I think what's happening here is um, is the next best thing. Captain, do you want to add to that? I would just like to add on to the risk that is associated with LSMGO 0.1% sulfur. It must be consumed under six months. Otherwise, it is exposed to bacteria. And that bacteria is a menacing bacteria. 
It's not like what we understand by bacteria in any disease. It attacks, and then for that, they recommend you add some additives to it to preserve it. In, in the operation of my company, we do not add any additives because additives can be addictive and we refrain from using that unless it is necessary. But this is a challenge not known till recently that LSMGO with 0.1% sulfur is attacked by bacteria, think about it. The second point I would like to add is about the compatibility. When two dissimilar products are stored in one tank, compatibility is an issue. It's an undying debate. What should that be, 50-50, 40-60? You ask 20 chief engineers, you will get 30 answers. The fact of the matter is there is definite stratification of oils in the tank, and it can virtually become unusable. So that is another risk you run now with this low sulfur and uh, surrounding the NOx issue as well. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, from the, the Norwegian point of view, we support uh, the level playing field. And uh, so uh, I think um, even if uh, some uh, areas or country don't apply to IMO, they may apply the same set of technical rules if they like. Uh, so you have the same regime uh, worldwide. And that would be a, a very good idea, I think. Uh, for the Hong Kong uh, initiative on 0.5 uh, sulfides uh, on BERT is very, very nice. And hopefully uh, a lot of the ships coming from uh, sa sailing between the Hong Kong area and, and the ECA areas in the uh, United States and in Europe, they will use uh, 0.1 uh, fuel. So you will get more than you require, I think, hopefully. So maybe you will have some experience uh, from the six, uh, first six months and then you maybe could change to point one, because that is the fuel uh, available uh, for the time being and uh, point five is not uh, quite uh, available and will not be uh, worldwide available for before 2020, I think. So you maybe uh, have a better reduction than you think <laughs> in Hong Kong. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to ask uh, Eddie a question about fuel availability in this region because you mentioned a few times about you know relying on local refinery supply for the type of fuel that this region needs in the future. Can you share with us, uh, if 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 you may, um, about the uh, low sulfur fuel availability in this part of the world? Um, any insights? Any ideas? I mean, really, just goes to um, yes, I can, of course. Um, from what Lasse has just said there um, about the what is the the availability of vessels that are coming into uh, into Hong Kong, you know, will they have the tank configuration to store a 0.5 percent product, irrespective of whether it looks more like a distillate product or a, or a fuel oil product, um, knowing that tank configurations are pretty limited. It depends on the, the vessel, it depends on the vessel's route. So almost the decision needs to be taken on a vessel by vessel basis. Um, the product that ExxonMobil is selling in Hong Kong, um, there is a regular sulfur fuel oil, so up to three and a half percent. And the ECA grade is actually a 0.05 percent. Um, I, can, I can't comment on what, um, what others are doing. So certainly, if you're needing to lift an ECA fuel, uh, the Hong Kong fuel, if we can call it that for the time being as well, you have got that point one already. Um, re other um, refineries that we are looking at. Um, Singapore is a major refinery for us, an integrated plant with chemicals um, as well as it being you know, a, a, a regular petroleum refinery. Um, we are looking to see if we can produce an HDME 50 or an AFME 200 type product through Singapore. Um, it's too early for me to, to share those results with you because what's important for me and for ExxonMobil is to have um, a quality product and continuous supply. So if I can produce a batch of it and say, here you go, knowing that in three weeks' time we don't have it anymore, that's, you know, we've, uh, we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot slightly. So we have challenged our scientists to work this for us, but the key for me 
on the marketing side is to have the quality product and continuous supply so that it can give you the benefits of safer switchover as well as you know safer use in, in boilers. Thank you. Um, is there any question from the floor? Can I have another one? No? Oh, okay. Billy. Uh, yeah, uh, EPD, uh, Billy Chung. Uh, I want to know the HDME uh, 50, is there any process of uh, standardization to apply ISO 8217? Would there be a change that would include uh, this type of uh, non fuel, non residual uh, type of things? I mean, the, the experience has, has told us, because we were the, the, the first kid on the block, you know, the first to market uh, HDME 50, it was sold because HD, heavy distillate. You know, initially we were selling it uh, to DMA specification with the, with the exceptions, you know, the, the benefits of, of a fuel oil. Uh, now we can clearly state for charter party agreements and for peace of mind, we can sell it to RMD 80. If your... Um, sort of question relates more to will ISO consider a new category between the DMA, the distillate type products, and the residual products, the RMA through to RMK, um, I don't know. It has been questioned, um, and I think the, the committee is, is due to meet or you know, is, is setting and, and perhaps revising those, some of those standards as of 2016. I'm, I'm certainly not the expert in, in, in this subject as well. So I don't think there is time to try and create an, an, another new category. So that's why we are able to sell on either commercial term. Um, and, but of course, when we do sell, what is important is that the people receiving the product are aware of its unique characteristics. So prior to each delivery, we give a best practices handling guide to the product. Yes, it's got distillate in its name, but don't put it into a distillate tank on board because that's not heated. This is highly viscous um, and therefore needs to be in a heated tank to keep it, uh, keep it pumpable, Only the, I, I, even though it, its pore point is around six degrees Celsius based on the last, the last test as well. So it's important with anything new that you help educate as best as you can. And talking to the purchasing side and the technical side is one thing. We ensure that every receiving vessel understands, is given, a non-marketing piece of material. There are no pretty pictures on it as well, because often us engineers just like to, you know, tell me the facts, tell me what I really need to do. Uh, and we found that that has worked um, brilliantly, um, and people like the product. Um, certainly those people that um, I mentioned that have claimed that we've lost propulsion by running on marine gas oil um, prior to these products being uh, available, um, they are, like I say, o over the moon and saying, why can't others do it? We're certainly challenging ourselves internally. Um, we know that some of our competitors are coming up with a mix of, of different products of different characteristics um, as well. But it is important to understand how they're made up. And, and if you do need to mix, test the compatibility before you do mix them. OK. Um, now, I'd like to pick up a point made by Captain Lene early on when he mentioned investment and return. And I remember this morning, there's a gentleman asking a question uh, with Christine, saying that if the government is going to provide any financial support to uh, the, uh, the implementation or the use of technology uh, for compliance. Now, um, I want to ask Captain Vinay, uh, if the government is going to provide some sort of support, what type of support it should be? And you know, I also want to you know, uh, ask Lasse to share with us your experience in Europe and in particular in Norway, um, because I know you have got some kind of financial support um, to the industry to encourage them to explore and to use new technology and to also comply with uh, the new regulation. Um, can you also share with us what's going on in that part of the world? But um, Captain Vinay, please. I would answer this way. The very definition of a traditional ship owner has changed. It's a vanishing element now. Now you see spurious uh, ghost ship owners suddenly ordering 50 ships. And now a traditional ship owner 
who cared for the quality, performance, safety of his vessel no longer exists. You have ship managers who manage 300 ships and cater to every different owner, and that owner himself has now become a commodity owner, investment banker. So we're talking about the ships are suffering from many sides. Add to that the curse of capital support it doesn't exist. So when you change the very definition and the structure of traditional owner, all you are inundated with is cost, cost and more cost. This modification surrounding the ECA is one of those. You haven't even heard about ballast water management. And when you talk about scrubbers on a ship, which is 10 to 15 meters tall, five meters diameter, there is no space. The ship will either carry that or the cargo. So I think we are the industry is at a crossroad right now, and there are no easy answers to this. And the world will have to settle down with some form of acceptable ship, ship owning, ship operation. Who pays for it? The end user and the consumer eventually will have to build this because ships will not survive. As I made a statement earlier, 94% of the ocean trade is carried by ships. So some will have to remain in a prosperous country and the others will have to be content living in a poor country. I don't see any easy solution. Sorry about that. Okay, over to you, Nasi. <coughs> yes, thank you. Well, in, uh, the development in Norway has, uh, has been driven by, uh, by several uh, factors. Uh, uh, in general, uh, uh, you could get grants if you, if you take on innovations. Uh, but of course, uh, it's only the first uh, ship uh, which can have uh, grants. Um, uh, but uh, there is another uh, scheme in Norway, which is a NOx tax scheme. And uh, uh, due to a uh, uh, Gothenburg protocol, Norway agreed to uh, to reduce NOx uh, and um, to uh, to have some um, uh, speed in this process. Uh, the government uh, said that uh, we will have a NOx tax on all ships calling Norwegian ports, uh, and um, this NOx tax was uh, rather expensive. It was uh, uh, about two dollars per kilo for the time being. And uh, the owner says that this is uh, is only uh, uh, some earnings for the government, so we don't like it. We like to uh, have it another way. We uh, we have uh, like to have a NOx funding. So they said that uh, we will uh, volunteer uh, establish a NOx fund, and every ship could uh, ship owner could join that fund and pay a, a small contribution. And this contribution is rather small because it's only a half dollar per kilo. So you could uh, you could uh, join the NOx fund, which is a private enterprise, and pay uh, one quarter of the price uh, for the NOx. And then if you invest in uh, in new technology, new ships uh, with uh, better engines, or even uh, use uh, LNG or uh, some new technology, you could get funding from this uh, NOx fund. You get your money back. And this has been a very good uh, arrangement, uh, but uh, for the time being, it's also only in Norway. But uh, a third uh, way is um, we have some local uh, ferries, uh, which is a part of the national road system. And there the government has said that it should be low emission engines. And then you don't need any, any uh, uh, grants or investment support because uh, everybody who, who will uh, build ships should use uh, new and modern technology. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions from the floor before the coffee break? No? Now, um, maybe finally, I would like to open another can of worm. Um, yeah, it will take maybe five minutes, uh, don't worry. Um, I want to talk about uh, chartered vessels and charterers um, and how, you know, how much attention we should pay to this sector as we begin our discussion on emission control area and tighter regulation because they are a very important part of 
you know, the, the system. And um, it's slightly different from the traditional type of uh, ship operators and owners. They have their own way of, you know, thinking, um, you know, can, can anyone educate me and also the audience, you know, whether this is something that we should consider as well as we plot our next move for tighter regulation. Anyone? <laughs> oh, this is tough, I know. <laughs> or anyone from the floor, actually, who would like to, you know, contribute to the discussion on the topic of, uh, you know, the charters. Okay, okay. No, no response, please, thank you. So, I mean, uh, at the beginning I did mention that it is indeed a paradox that you invest in something with no guarantees of return. Nobody runs ships to keep people employed. You employ people to run ships. And a time will come when you cannot do that and a lot of ships will be laid up. So this is the challenge all of us, not only here, but all over, six billion people have to face, how to overcome this. So small things like a scrubber tower converting or said to be converting NOx ain't going to work. That's not a solution. You have to have superior technology, which will neutralize, will reduce, reverse, and recover NOx that industry exists. And I will talk about it tomorrow. So it has to be a radical decision, a radical solution, and not this small inching towards something which may may never happen. That's the way it should move, I think. Okay, um, Eddie. Yeah, not uh, don't know a huge amount on the chartering side. Um, as ExxonMobil, we are, I, I believe, one of the largest charters of tanker tonnage um, anywhere in the in the world now as well, and. Uh, after safety, the second objective for ExxonMobil is following the laws. So if legislation insists that you need to you know, burn a certain product at a certain sulfur level or with certain sort of NOx emissions, we will, we will follow that. That will be built into the, into the charter party agreements. Uh, we still continue you know, to purchase fuel for the charter party agreements, knowing that we may not have that lubricant consideration because you know, somebody else is driving. Um, so I uh, don't know whether that's added to the... Well, that's system. good, at least uh, we, uh, we got an answer <laughs> before the coffee break. Um, now, just one last chance. Any more questions from the floor before... Oh, okay, thank you. All right, let me be fair. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, the simplest form is that, you know, if I, as an operator, that's a commercial operator, I move containers in and out of Hong Kong, I charter a ship which is owned by TCC, Captain Vine, right? And uh, in uh, the charter party, it'll say, you know, you have to supply fuel of a certain quality. So I will say, well, I'll supply whatever I can get. And uh, at some point, uh, Vine might have to agree with what I say because the market is not very good. But Vine would say, well, you have to buy this ExxonMobil. And I said, well, there mightn't be any ExxonMobil. You know, there'll be another fuel station here. But it'll be sort of within the specification. Now, I'm in my right to supply that fuel. But Vine might not like that fuel on board his ship because it, you know, plays havoc with his engine. Plus, he's the one who has to comply with the regulation in and out of Hong Kong be it 0.5% or 0.1%. Uh, it's not my problem, because it doesn't say that in the Charter Party. So this is the kind of worm you're talking about, you know, that you suddenly have uh, a guy using the ship and being responsible for supplying the fuel who does not have the same concerns about the engine, its wear and tear, uh, and, 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 and so on. So you have, uh, you know, this. So why I say don't go there, I said, you know, uh, don't go there. You cannot regulate your way out of that. It has to be something that Captain v uh, Vine and I have to sort out between us, uh, and uh, maybe we'll go to some charter party regulator to have that sorted out. But I don't think that, uh, that we can do it from, uh, from this side. I hope that clarifies.
Well, thank you. Maybe you should go with uh, Captain Vinay to coffee and then sort it out, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, uh, yes. Just, uh, it, it goes back to even more basic than that. You know, the ISO specifications, ISO 8217 um, for purchasing fuels, I mean, there are still a lot of people buying to 2005 standards, even though 2012 is there. Has been there for three years now as well. So I would just ask, you know, why are you not buying to those higher standards? They are there to protect you to a point. However, they are a purchasing standard. They are not a usage standard. You can buy product to RMG 380, and it will give you the maximum limit for aluminium and silicon, or cat fines, is 60 ppm. If you put that product straight into your engine without purifying it thoroughly, you'll kill your engine in no time. So always be aware of what you have bought. If you're aware of it, and indeed, the gentleman you know, says, I'm buying it, but it's down to Captain Vinay you know, to, 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 to figure out. As long as they are aware of it, engineers are pretty canny people and can handle many things. Purification systems on board a vessel are there. And the reason we say 12 ppm, because a purifier is 80% efficient. So be aware of what you've bought, but also consider that it is a purchasing specification, not a usage specification. Thanks very much. I would address it this way. A time has come when the charter party clauses will be rewritten. I'm yet to meet a charter who has accepted ownership that it is him who, supply, who is required to supply a certain grade of fuel, be it 8217, 205, or 10, or 12. There have been disputes, and I have personally called and told the charter that we are in this together. You have to find the fuel for me. It's not enough for you to give me the fuel, but you have to give it to the particular ISO standards, to which the charter had even brazenly mentioned, that's your business. My business is to supply you. I said, no, you're mistaken. If I ever go to arbitration, we'll both be on the floor. The case happened was in Port of Cosmino, where you're not allowed to send the samples anywhere, and you have to test it locally. And uh, we found it very hard to trust anybody with the results of the analysis. So you are caught in such places sometimes. Lucky that we had enough to go from there to Anacortes without touching the new fuel. But there's a guideline on ship, at least on the TCC ships. You shall not put anything in the engine without knowing what is in it. And we follow that to the letter. And the engineers and, of course, the operators thank us for that. So a time is there very soon, I think, where charter parties, bunker clauses, tolerances, everything will be rewritten to cater to the new regulations. And we all have to comply with that. Otherwise, the commerce, international trade will come to stand still. Thank you. I think you would agree with me that we have got some really good discussion uh, going on just now. Um, can you please join me to thank all the speakers and panelists?